Good morning, Open Door Ministries, and to all our friends and family on Facebook and YouTube. It's great to be back here sharing the Word of God with you again. We are on this series called Crucifying Our Politics. And as I, as I have said before, when I get up here and I preach a sermon or I teach from the Word of God, I am really sharing my own personal journey in faith. And so this particular series has been a challenge to me personally because of the way that I was raised and what my current studies are leading me to now. Uh, this week, the sermon is entitled, Evangelicals, You Got Conned. And I believe this sincerely. Now, I was raised an evangelical. I was raised a fundamentalist evangelical. I attended private schools all my life. I was raised to be a culture warrior. I was raised to be politically active. And some of the things that I'm going to say during this sermon are very difficult for me to say because it goes against everything I was trained and taught as a child who believed what the leaders and authorities above me taught me. And I've had to really sort through a lot of the emotional feelings about that uh, to come to what I believe is a more Christian view of politics. I start off here with a picture of Ronald Reagan. Now, originally, having grown up as an evangelical, being raised in private schools, I was a Reagan Republican. When I originally registered to vote, I came of age to vote in the 80s. I registered as a Republican. The very first presidential vote I ever cast was for Ronald Reagan. Everybody told me, this is God's man. He's really going to do for the church, for Christians, things that all these other presidents have never done. We need to vote him in. And indeed, it was the evangelical voting bloc that helped usher Ronald Reagan into his presidency. One of the big things that Ronald Reagan kept promising, one of the things he kept sort of pointing out and harping on was about school prayer. Now, growing up in the late 60s, early 70s as a child, oftentimes we would hear complaints from pastors and various other leaders about how terrible it was that prayer had been removed from school, that schools no longer started each morning with the Pledge of Allegiance and a prayer. And Ronald Reagan, of course, grabbed onto this and began talking about how important school prayer was. He said in a candlelighting ceremony for school prayer that we seek a constitutional amendment to permit voluntary school prayer. God should never have been expelled from America's classroom in the first place. And looking back now as an adult upon what was said to me as a teenager from Ronald Reagan, I'm like, this is probably the most meaningless statement I've ever heard. You do not need a constitutional amendment to permit voluntary school prayer because voluntary school prayer has never been forbidden. Voluntary school prayer has never been illegal. Nobody has ever stopped voluntary school prayer. This is a problem that doesn't exist. And he's offering a constitutional amendment solution to a non problem. And quite frankly, God has never been expelled from America's classroom. The forced prayers that they had were removed from the classroom, but God is still permitted in the classroom. Now, I'm a college professor. I'm allowed to talk about my faith if it relates to the subject at hand. I can talk about God if it relates to the subject at hand. I can share what I believe. It's never, God has never been kicked out of the classroom. And quite frankly, I think it's kind of funny too that here we have evangelicals who believe that God is omnipresent and everywhere at once. Did we suddenly somehow create a barricade that God can no longer cross to get into the classroom? That would seem to make God relatively weak. But be that as it may. The U.S. Supreme Court has never ruled that kids can't pray in school. What the court has done, and it continues to do, is to strike down school-sponsored prayers and devotional exercises as violations of religious liberty. I can remember 
going through high school. I can remember as a youth pastor going to public high schools and joining kids for an event called See You at the Poll. And we would get together and we would pray on school grounds. And they didn't stop that because it was completely voluntary. You will always have prayer in school. I forget who said it, but I'm not even sure who first quoted it. But it said as long as algebra class is taught in schools, there will be prayers in schools. Just about every algebra test, I would guess. The court doesn't stop voluntary prayers in schools. You can have religious organizations that meet on campus and use school facilities as long as they are not mandatory or run by instructors. Now, I have even been the sponsoring faculty at the college for several of the religious uh, clubs on campus, and I don't have a problem with that, and nobody else does. So this idea that we have kicked God out of schools, you can't pray in schools, is quite frankly a lie. And if you believe it, you've been conned. Evangelicals have been conned on a number of issues, not only prayer in schools, but Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court case that made abortion legal in the United States. Ever since that particular ruling, over and over again, we have been promised by politicians that they will overturn Roe v. Wade. And they need to raise funds to overturn Roe v. Wade. And you must vote a certain way and for certain politicians and for a certain political party to help overturn Roe v. Wade. And yet it hasn't happened. There, were, of course, was the Save the Children campaign. That was Anita Bryant. We got to make sure homosexuality is illegal because they're going to recruit all our children. And a similar campaign with Protect Marriage. That if we have same-sex marriage, all of society will fall apart. And yet, here we are, more than a decade later, after same-sex marriage has become legal, and society still exists. And over and over again, each one of these issues have become wedge issues used to con evangelicals into not only their financial support, but into their unwavering support for one political party by voting for them every time. Let's talk about all of these things. Prayers in schools. Now, just recently, William James in 2014 said that there were five negative de developments in the nation's public schools after prayer was removed from school. He said academic achievement has plummeted, including SAT scores. There was an increased rate of out-of-wedlock births. There was increase in illegal drug use, increase in juvenile crime, and deterioration of school behavior. And unfortunately, none of this is true. When you begin looking at some of these issues, you can see, for example, here in California, the California youth continue to bring steep declines in juvenile arrests. The juvenile delinquency rate is actually going down. This is from the Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice uh, Research uh, 2017. We can continue to see that many of the things that they claim are negative impacts because we remove school from prayer are actually on the decline. And one of the things that we can also see is that just because school prayer was removed and some of these things were happening doesn't mean the two are related. In fact, there is a stronger correlation between the poverty rates and economic injustice having to do with juvenile crime, out of wedlock marriages, and all the other issues going on than there is to whether or not you're praying in school. So why aren't we looking at issues of economic injustice between wage disparity? Why is it that we keep people working two or three jobs at a time at poverty level wages, keeping people in poverty their entire life why aren't we looking at that? Because that has a higher impact upon our crime rates, our marriage rates, our divorce rates, our out-of-wedlock pregnancies. That's the issue that we should be dealing with. 
but we are being distracted. It's like a shiny little object being waved in front of us saying, look, it's all about school prayer. We need to be worried about this. And that is a wedge issue specifically designed to entice Christians to chase after. What about Roe v. Wade? Well, let's look at all the presidencies and congresses that we've had. We've had Reagan, we had George Bush, we had George W. Bush, we had Donald Trump. These four Republican presidents who had enormous uh, popular vote support chose not to do anything about this issue. In fact, George W. Bush had the 108th and 109th Congress. For two years, the Republicans controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency, and yet they did nothing on this issue. Donald Trump had the 115th Congress. Republicans controlled the presidency and both houses, and yet they did nothing about this issue. And if this is such an important issue, if this is the big shiny red button that they hold out to evangelicals year after year as they make campaign promises and collect funds saying, we need to overturn this, why hasn't it happened? And the sad fact is this, there is no money in banning abortion. This is merely a political tactic. If abortion were to go away, what would they raise funds on? See, it makes money for them to continually have a problem that they need to fight, and they can make more money. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, what will motivate evangelicals to support the Republican Party? And the answer is, not much. What is left if you take away that one issue? Com comprehensive sex education and access to birth control have been proven to lower the abortion rate. And yet, the Republican Party and evangelicals oppose these two items. We have seen, and it's been proven in the Netherlands, that they have the lowest teen pregnancy rate and the lowest abortion rate. And the reason why is because they have comprehensive sex education and access to birth control. If we are truly pro-life, if we truly wanted to lower the abortion rate or and almost eliminate it, to almost eliminate all abortions, then we would be voting for politicians who support these things, and yet time and again evangelicals are told not to support these things. They are told to support abstinence-only education, which has been proven to actually increase the number of out-of-wedlock pregnancies. The New York Times highlighted the state of New York's success story in which teen pregnancy rates dropped 40% and the abortion rate amongst teens dropped by an astounding 42% because of comprehensive sex education and access to birth control. A Guttmacher study determined that for every dollar spent on family planning programs, that's comprehensive sex education and access to birth control, that the government actually saves $7.09 on every other program to alleviate poverty to all these other programs needed to support all of these children who are being born. It's fiscally responsible to promote comprehensive sex education and access to birth control. And the Republican Party, which is supposedly the party of fiscal responsibility, refuses to see this because they know evangelicals believe in purity culture. And they keep holding out this idea that they will overturn Roe v. Wade and they're going to oppose sex education, they're going to oppose birth control and promote purity culture simply to get the votes. When it's been proven, these things don't work. One of the biggest arguments that I see when we talk about Roe v. Wade, the abortion issue, is over and over again, religious leaders stand behind the pulpit, they send out the emails and the fundraising letters, and they tell you, you must vote for a politician who is pro-life, anti-abortion. If you don't, 
then you become complicit in murder. You're just as guilty of murder as the abortion doctor who performs that abortion. If you vote Democrat, if you're a liberal, you are a murderer. And this, my friends, is a political lie. If this is true, that we are guilty by association in how we vote, then we are guilty of every warmongering president we put into office. This country, the United States, has been at war my entire lifetime. There has not been a time that we have not been at war somewhere in this world. And I'm not just talking about the killing of soldiers. I'm talking about women and children and civilians who are killed and cleaned up with the polite political phrase, collateral damage. If I voted for the president who sent down those bombs, who sent those soldiers, the people who committed those atrocities, then I'm just as guilty by the same logic that I'm guilty if I vote for somebody who is pro-abortion. If they're pro-war, I'm guilty of all that blood on my hands too. We are not guilty by association. These are not our actions and our doings. And yet we are lied to constantly because it creates an atmosphere of fear that I don't want to be a murderer. And it's just a way of manipulating us. Let's talk about protecting marriage. Oh my gosh, according to a quantitative study with more than 1,500 lesbian, gay, and bisexual participants living in the United States where same-sex marriage is outlawed was directly related to chronic social stress and psychological problems and not due to pre-existing mental health issues or other factors. This, of course, is uh, the Rotsky, Riggle, Horn, Miller study of two, uh, uh, 2009. Did you catch that? that where we criminalize homosexuality, where we criminalize same-sex marriage, there is an increase in mental health disorders. An increase. That the stigmatization of this particular sexual persuasion is causing mental health disorders. So as Christians, how should we respond to this? Shouldn't we be acting in love and promoting the mental health of people? But, but I believe it's a sin, and won't I be promoting sin? I don't know. Are you actually doing it? When we look at couples who had actually formalized their relationships in socially validating ways, such as marriage commitment ceremonies and re registered domestic relationships, they had significantly better mental health than those who hadn't, especially younger people. This is according to the mental health benefits of relationship formalization amongst lesbian and gay men in same-sex relationships, uh, 2015. What we're seeing is that we have healthier, happier adults and young people if we allow this. Isn't the well-being of our fellow human being, whether they are sinner or enemy, part of our obligation to love? Shouldn't we be promoting that rather than making it worse for them? If we supposedly are discriminating against them and criminalizing their behavior and it's causing them harm because of our actions, aren't we then in the wrong? It was predicted over and over again that if we allow same-sex marriage, society would fall apart. And yet society has not fallen apart. In fact, what we see is an increase in overall mental health. Divorce rates in the United States declined from 2009 to 2019, but the rates vary from state to state, of course. This is, of course, uh, from the U.S. Census of 2010. One of the things that I heard over and over again is if we allow same-sex marriage, it's going to destroy the sanctity of marriage and divorce is going to get out of control. 
And yet, since same-sex marriage has been legal, we are seeing a decline in divorce rates. By legalizing this, we didn't suddenly get out of control divorce. We didn't see society fall apart. We're actually seeing a decline in all of this. So everything that was predicted was wrong. It was merely a scare tactic to get you to vote a certain way. Evangelicals, you got conned. And that brings me to the topic of fear. Fear is the political weapon of the kingdoms of this world. Fear. You know, I'm on the mailing list for a lot of fundagelical organizations. And I get emails almost daily, and they're nothing more than fear emails. We can't have the Gender Equality Act. If you allow the Gender Equality Act, do you know what's going to happen? You're going to have these perverted men going into women's restrooms and attacking your daughters in the, west, in the restroom. And yet that has simply not happened. If we allow uh, gay marriage to happen, they're going to come and they're going to close down churches and they're going to they're throw your pastor in jail. And that has not happened happened. Every pastor has the right to decide whether or not they will perform a marriage. You cannot force me or anyone else to perform a marriage we don't want to. But they'll throw you in jail. I get scare messages that tell me that if we don't vote all the Democrats and liberals out of Congress, then the next step is they're getting ready to arrest Christians and take us to re-education camps. And these are nothing more than blatant lies to promote fear. They get us to fear that they, whoever they have decided, right, all these people, they, liberals, socialists, communists, atheists, homosexuals, will recruit our children, turning them into sex maniacs and Satanists. <gasps> if you talk about birth control, they'll become sex maniacs. If you allow abortion, you know, there'll be just, just wanton sex everywhere. If you allow them to show this particular song during the Super Bowl, it's going to turn kids into Satanists. Didn't you see Lady Gaga? She actually performed a satanic ritual on, during the Super Bowl. And it's nothing but fear over and over again. If you don't vote for us, you know, the ones who support all your religious liberties, then you're guilty by association. You're just as bad as them. You're a murderer, and you're, you're causing Satanism, and you're going to make this whole country decline and fall apart. And they attempt to keep us in a constant state of fear, for that is the political weapon of the kingdoms of this world. I have to try to reconcile that with what I read in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I read things like Psalms 27.1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Well, well, well they, they might round us up. They might round us up and take us to education camps. They might round us up and torture us. They might round us up and kill us. If so, I will not be afraid. The first century Christian martyrs were not afraid, and they laid down their life. Jesus was not afraid, and he laid down his life. Am I clinging to my life? Am I clinging to my life out of fear that I will never walk in the freedom of my salvation? Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Fear. There's an industry just designed to keep us afraid. The media keeps us afraid keeps us afraid and anxious and outraged. It plays upon our emotions constantly to manipulate us. 
And Jesus says to us, peace. Peace I give to you. My peace. Jesus had peace. Why did Jesus have peace? Why wasn't he afraid that it was going to cost him his life? Why wasn't he afraid of the horrible death? Because he knew two things. One, he knew he was completely and fully aligned with God's will. And two, he knew that in the end, God would justify him and raise him from the dead. Is that not true of us as Christians today? If we are completely aligned with the will of Christ, does it matter what the world does? Does it matter they throw me in a re-education camp? Does it matter they threaten to cut off my head with a guillotine like in the Left Behind books? None of that matters because I'm aligned with the will of Christ and I know that I will be justified when he raises me from the dead. You don't need to be afraid. He gives us peace. Christ gives us peace, his peace, the peace that he had. And he doesn't give to us like the world gives it to us because the world gives us false peace, false security. Do what I say, be compliant. And, and I won't hurt you. That's the peace of this world. That's the peace they give. But we are not to be afraid. In 2 Timothy 1.7 it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. He has not given us a spirit of fear. And yet I see preachers stand behind the pulpit every Sunday preaching fear. Fear, fear, fear. And they work in the service of politics, warning us, I've had a prophetic vision. I saw them rounding us up. I saw a prophetic vision. We're going to see pastors in jail because they won't perform a same-sex marriage. God spoke to me and he said that he sent this hurricane and destroyed everything because of abortion. And they sell you fear and fear and fear. And that is not the spirit of God. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. But we have a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Each and every Christian has power. For Christ has overcome this world. How did he overcome this world? By not being afraid of it. By not being afraid of what they could do to him physically. Oh, they could kill him, but that didn't stop him. We have power. All this world can do to us is in the physical realm, and yet in the spiritual realm. We are completely and safely within God's hands with eternal security. We have the power of love. By demonstrating love, we become the light of this world, and we change it. And we have a sound mind. Our minds should not be troubled by the fears and the anxieties and the outrages that are just poured out every day over every piece of media and every social media platform. We have terms for this that they have, have now created. Doom scrolling as you go through your Twitter feed and your Facebook feed and everything else. And it's all designed to keep us anxious. It's all designed to keep us in fear. It's all designed to manipulate us. But we have a sound mind that says, I don't need to worry about those things. I've taken a huge step back from Twitter and Facebook, and I can't tell you how much anxiety, how much anger, how much fear, how much outrage has just disappeared from my life. I, I'm just like, wow, I, I feel, oh yeah, peace. That's what I'm feeling right now. That I don't need to constantly check my Twitter feed to see what new outrageous thing was said and I need to respond to immediately. I can just let that all go. For I have peace. For I know that my life, my soul, my very being rests within the very hand of God. And whatever is in his hand cannot be snatched from him. I have peace no matter what happens in this world. Evangelicals, I'm talking to you right now. Hear me when I tell you, you have sold out your birthright. 
In Genesis, we get the story of Jacob and Esau. And it reads like this. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. This is why he was called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Evangelicals, you have sold your birthright. You have sold it. We had the birthright of peace, of Christ's peace within our life. We had the spirit of power and love, and instead we sold it because we got fearful. Oh, I think I'm going to die. There's no prayer in school. Abortions become legal. <gasps> the world's going to end. It's all so horrible. I feel so insecure. I feel so not safe. And we sold our birthright for a false security. We sold it for a false peace, for false promises of security, for influence and for power, for just a smidgen of control that made us feel a little bit safer. We sold what was ours for the cheapness of the false promises, the false peace, the false security of this world. We decided to jump into bed with politics, and they have been prostituting us ever since. They count on our votes. They hold out promise after promise. Oh, we'll put prayer back in school. We'll do a constitutional amendment. We'll overturn Roe v. Wade. We'll prevent uh, gender equality and same-sex marriage. Just keep voting for us. Keep voting for us. Give us your money. And it's all false. Those things will not bring you peace. You can put prayer back in school. It doesn't mean anybody is sincerely praying or that prayer is even happening in the heart. You can force kids to stand up and recite the Ten Commandments. doesn't mean they're going to follow them. You can end same-sex marriage supposedly to protect the sanctity of your third marriage because you're a serial adulterer. It doesn't make you a Christian. These things are false. And yet, we've been conned, and we fall for them over and over again. Okay, so now that I've said that, the big question is, how do you live this out? When we understand that we got conned, what should we do as Christians how do we worship God by living this out in our own lives? And the first thing I would say to you is this. When you feel fear, when you feel fear, know that you're being manipulated. Fear equals manipulation. Fear is the power. Fear is the weapon of this world. Within the kingdom of God, there is no fear. For perfect love, the perfect love of God cast out fear. It doesn't exist within the kingdom of God. When you feel fear, that's of this world. Fear is of this world, and you're being manipulated. If anyone, including religious leaders, are trying to make you afraid, you need to ask yourself one very important question. What are they selling me? What are they trying to sell me? It's all manipulation. Sometimes we come to understand this. We know that when we watch television, there are certain commercials. Do you have bad breath? You're never going to get a date in your entire life. Better buy my product. Oh, dear. I'll be dateless. I'm, I'm fearful. I'm anxious. Better hurry out and buy it. We recognize that tactic. But do we recognize it in politics? Do we recognize it in the pulpit? What is it doing in the pulpit? Fear does not belong in the pulpit because it is of this world. Live fearless, my Christian brothers and sisters. Live fearless, for there's nothing this world can do to you that can harm you. The early Christian martyrs had no fear. They understood this. 
They lived in a time that was much worse than we live in now. Oh, but you don't understand, you know, uh, you know, with all this craziness, with, uh, you know, this marriage equality. and all, uh, We commit the same sins that were going on then. The pagan religion practices of that day, the society norms and morals of that day were no worse than the ones today. We haven't invented new sins. We've just invented faster ways to do them. That's the only improvement that we've made. They lived fearless. They lost jobs, they lost wealth, they lost status, and they lost their lives because they refused to become entangled with the kingdom of this world. They refused to play politics. They refused, and they were murdered. They were martyred. They were killed in horrible ways. And yet they went, oftentimes, if you read the Book of Martyrs, Fox's Book of Martyrs, I will admit to you, I was forced to read that in high school. I hated that book back then. But as an adult, with a little clearer vision, and I read it now, I'm like inspired. Inspired by men and women and children who went to their deaths praying and singing and praising God because they were not of this world, but they knew that they belonged to the kingdom of God and they went fearless. That you could take all the weapons of this world, every weapon formed against them, including fear, and you could hurl it at them, but they had the shield of their salvation that protected them. Fearless. We need to recapture that spirit. We live here in America. We're Christians in America. We don't suffer persecution. We suffer fake persecution, faux persecution. Oh my goodness. They're persecuting me because I don't like the Starbucks cup that they made. It doesn't say Merry Christmas on it. I'm being persecuted. Really? Is that the worst you got? Let's go find some first century Christians and ask them how they feel about it. If they're feeling persecuted because Starbucks doesn't have Merry Christmas on their cups. We live in a country with no persecution against us. And yet, we have entire industries, all kinds of political action committees and the media, corporations that are owned by Christian fundangelicals cranking out fear, cranking out anxiety, telling you to be afraid, telling you you need to be upset so they can collect your money and keep their organizations going and going and going. They keep creating fights that don't even exist so they can go out there and fight them for you on your behalf. Just send that check now. It's a scam. We got conned. And worse yet, we got conned into abandoning our mission that Christ set before us to win this world to him, to play politics instead. When we are confronted with fear, when we are confronted with politics, we need to ask ourselves the same question that Jesus asked us. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your souls? Evangelicals, I'm asking you now, you may grab the presidency. You may get your evangelical president up there in the White House. You may control all of the Senate and all of Congress. But what good will it do you if it costs you your very soul? For the ends do not justify the means. If you had to sell your birthright for political power, what good is it going to do? You may be able to pass every law that you've ever wanted. You may be able to get your entire wish list. We are going to forbid abortion, make it illegal, and we're going to throw mothers in prison who try to get one, and we're going to get all the doctors who perform abortions in prison, and we're going to throw all the homosexuals in prison, and we're going to throw anybody who supports them in prison, and anybody who doesn't pray in church, they're going to go to prison, and we're going to execute everybody who doesn't believe the same way that we believe. You may get every item on your wish list, but you've only become the oppressor and not the liberator. You've only become the guilty party in the name of God. 
You'll have lost your very soul. You sold your birthright, and you are on the verge of losing your very soul today. It's time to come back to the kingdom of God. It's time to realize you got conned and to step out of it and to step away from it. And with that, I better close in prayer. This is, this is a message that, that strikes my own heart. When I'm up here and I'm getting excited and I'm yelling, I'm yelling at myself because I know I got conned. And now it's time for me to return to the kingdom. And I pray that you do as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for our nation, not as a political group, but I pray for the nation that you created, not the United States, but as you said, you are creating a nation of holy priests unto you. I pray for that nation of holy priests known as Christians that crosses every border, that crosses every tongue, every nationality. I pray for your holy nation, the kingdom of God. That is the nation I pray for today. Lord, help us. Help us because we are selling out. We sell our very birthright of peace and power and love to live not with a spirit of fear. We sell it out with false security and promises. Lord, I just pray that every Christian that, that hears this, I know that these words hurt. I know that they go down your throat like acid. I know that it strikes at our heart. So many of us, so many of my generation, Lord, were raised up to be culture warriors, to be political activists. Help us to break away from that. Help us to see where we were deceived. Father, help us as Christians not to pick up the weapon of politics, but instead to pick up the light of love, to let it shine in every dark corner of this world, to become the city upon the hill that draws people to you and to you alone. May we be so loving. May we be so kind. May we be so filled with your peace. May we be so like your image to this world that people are drawn to you. Father, I also just pray right now, I know that during this time, the people in this congregation, the people watching right now, they have fear, they have anxiety. We are trained and raised up in fear and anxiety. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit just send peace peace. Let us know your peace, the peace that you give, not as this world gives. Let us know your peace, Lord. Some of us need to just step away, Lord, from all the social media and all the garbage on TV that just fills us with anxiety and, and, and anger. We just need to step away so that we can reclaim your peace. Father, I pray for those who are sick and I pray for those who are taking care of the sick. Give us the strength that we need to serve those who are sick right now. Give us the endurance that we need. Give us the love that we need. I just pray this in your name. Amen. And with that, that's a wrap for this week. Until we meet again, may God bless you. Go in peace.